What does climate change mean for the future of water? And what can Europe do about it? The big questions we've been putting to a top panel of experts in our latest Euronews virtual debate. Here are some of the highlights. We work across um, Africa, Asia, mostly a bit in Latin America. And the reason why water aid exists is because nearly one in three people still live with no water close to home. And this is impacting every aspect of people's lives. So from uh, access to food and being able to be food secure to, um, to good health. So imagine giving birth in a health center with no access to running water. Half of those in the least developed countries have no water or being a girl who has to go and walk miles to pick up water and basically therefore doesn't, uh, isn't able to go to school. So this is why water aid exists. This is why we work in the countries where we work. And um, it's, you know, it's, it's a challenge today uh, where, you know, millions of people live without access to water, without access to sanitation or even soap. Um, and uh, it's affecting... And it's quite shocking that we're talking about this in 2022, isn't it? It, we're talking about this in 2022. Um, in 2022, you have almost 800 million people without access to clean water, which is one of the most basic necessities of life. The fact that water access to water is also an issue in Europe is widely underestimated. Just like last summer in Belgium, there were uh, there were discussions and news about issues with water, and uh, people were advised not to put some water in on their plants in the gardens, not to use water for other issues. And there is also the cost that comes with it, and that is quite high for uh, single parents, for example, who have to pay the energy bill. They also have to pay the water bill. So we feel that there is financially a, a request for that. Of course, the, the consequence of this difficult access to water will be different depending on the level of development of a country. If you take a poor African country, it will be different, of course. There are certain regions of the world where we've seen strong uh, changes in, say, precipitation overall. So the Mediterranean is one area where there should be quite you know, uh, large concerns, even though, there's, as Juan said, there's, there's good adaptation for, for many years and and good use of technology to, to approach this. And if we look to the future as well, one of the regions where our, our climate models are actually showing us where there's going to be uh, big problems in the future is the Mediterranean. And there's quite some consensus across climate models that that area will get, will get drier overall, but also more extreme events and more flood events as well. So you have this, this um, combination of overall drying plus more extreme events, which is going to be a real challenge in the future. But we do need to get better models and reduce those uncertainties as well so we can make better decisions. The impact of climate change in the agriculture is very significant. Uh, according with the climate data, the last five years are very warm compared to the previous year. Uh, it is causes that uh, one of the problems of our southern regions in Europe, the desertification, this means the loss of fertile soil and vegetation uh, are increasing. Technology and, and infrastructure, it's also, it's, it's a really important part of the solution. And I think it's the most visible and easy to understand part of the solution of providing water to people. But it's sometimes not the, the most important, or the, it's obviously a part of it, but, but there's more complex bits which we need to, to get right, which what Ray is focusing a lot on, which is on making the service work, right? Everything around the infrastructure. You can install the greatest most innovative pipe but if it breaks and you have no one who understands how to fix it then that's not going to work right so it's about finding those solutions that are future proofed as i was as i was speaking um, and there's quite a few things that you need to focus on in order to make those solutions future proofed first you need political will you need lead leaders that understand the issue and then understand the the solutions to the problems of the water crisis um, you need and you need those leaders at a national government, um, you know, at a, at a local government level, etc. You need expertise. You need the, 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 the technicians that know how to fix if something goes wrong. And then you need a service, the right policies that regulate the way that water, uh, you know, gets gets shared uh, so that everyone benefits. And it's not only the most powerful who maybe have access to water um, and, and the people who, you know, who lack, you know, the poorest people, the most excluded also are able to benefit from that service. So it's easy to think that it's always a technical infrastructure solution, but there's much more to, in our experience, there's much more to it 
than than just uh, having the pump or the or the pipes installed. Juan, I'd like to go over to you in Murcia in Spain at Novagric, a company working in the smart agriculture sector. As we talk about this in terms of setting the context for this debate today, obviously industry and business have got a big role to play in the future of water. You're involved in the agriculture sector, which is thirsty for water. I think it accounts for about 70% of the usage of fresh water supply. So it's drinking a lot of water. Do you think industry, including agriculture, is waking up to the problem of water and where it's going in the future? From our position as a company based in the southeast of Spain, that design and install a fertilization and irrigation systems, we think that there is in so, some regions of Europe, a southern Europe and some Mediterranean area, they, there is a great concern about the ability of water. Uh, here in Murcia and Almeria, we are pioneers in the use of water for agriculture. But now um, let me go, give you a specific data. Here, the use of fresh water available uh, for agriculture is the 90% of the available resources. 90%? So for this, 90% uh, caused by the high agriculture developed here in this area. And uh, we need uh, to have a water warranty here. Uh, also, we are a demand or request by the use of technology to be used uh, another uh, water results as a uh, purified and desalinated water and uh, improved technology, uh, technologies that uh, helps to gain uh, efficiency and saving in the water in the first water source. I'm very positive about technology and innovation. I think that it always needs to go together with ethics, just like anything in life uh, nowadays. But while we regulate and make sure that uh, ethics are taken into account, we we should never block the the, the innovation innovative process. I think that is what sometimes the lack of flexibility of uh, policy makers and the lack of dialogue between innovators like, uh, like 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 the project I just heard about and uh, other very good projects going on, NGOs, organizations also like World Aid. I think there is to be much more dialogue between policymakers and those on the ground so that we have solutions that are not designed to block but designed to to uh, um, to, re to relieve and also to uh, unlock all the potential that we are not using right now. At the same time, uh, we can. I saw experiences because of the work I'm doing now about water of uh, people who produce water being just using air in the desert, and it's quite amazing. So I think I am totally open to that. If you show me a flying horse, I will ask you how it did, how you managed to, and I will try to help you. We've seen with things like um, Russia's invasion of Ukraine and the fallout of that, that the supply chain has been badly affected. Are there some lessons that are being learned about supply chain disruption right now that could be applied to water in the future in terms of what we need to do to prepare for supply chain disruption? Um, I'm sure there is. There are lessons to learn. I'm not a, a, an engineer or a technical expert, but from my point of view as a politician and as a citizen, I think that wherever information or commodities or products are being transported, whether it is on the ground or online, uh, we have learned recently that we need to be careful about that. Look at all the cyber attacks. Look at what is happening about the dependence on oil and gas. Someone could just take the water as an hostage. I think that is a, pos a serious possibility in places where it's quite unstable. And I do believe you need to protect these sources and the way in which you are transporting them, not only against, um, you know, hygiene issues, but also against uh, criminals who can actually uh, do that. And if it's very hot and you don't have water, it can really become very depressing very fast. A lot can happen. We've seen that many times before, where we see, for example, a drought happening in one country uh, that's affecting you know, crop production, uh, and there's a trade in that crop, and it that affects uh, supply chains. It affects food production, food trade. It affects food security in some places. And we're, we're starting, to, I think, to see that because of the Ukraine war, uh, the impacts on the, on the wheat exports. And uh, you know, the, in some places, if, if, uh, if there's real water dependency in those supply chains, we can change it but we can't do it with everything. And we're probably gonna see that in terms of global food insecurity because there, there potentially is no alternative to some of the wheat supplies that would normally be coming from Ukraine. So we need to do a lot to try to understand the resiliency 
um, of these supply chains that are water dependent and in some places critically water dependent and think about how to, you know, should we be changing those? Should we be growing certain types of water thirsty crops in certain areas where we're using unsustainable groundwater to do that, for example? Should we be doing it in different ways to make it much more resilient? That's, that's a lot about planning around water and understanding water footprints, but it's a lot around global trade and the economic drivers around that as well. Businesses have a major role to play in making sure that they use water sustainably. Justin was, was, was giving a few examples of that. We are, for example, part of an initiative that is looking at um, encouraging sustainability, um, accountability of businesses when it comes to the, the use of water, the fair water footprints. Um, and that's, that's initiatives like that that really encourage and, and, and make sure that businesses are aware of their impact on water and what they can do to make that better. Um, so I think that there is an increased awareness. There's more that needs to be done. And, um, and I think that we all have a role to play, NGOs, businesses, academics, uh, governments, parliamentarians. So, so I think it's, that, that's an opportunity here to get that right. What should be done to tax public buildings and offices for their water consumption? And would that help to balance things out? Um, Asita, a Belgian MEP in Brussels, do you think uh, public buildings should be taxed and offices for their water consumption? Uh, if I understand the question well, it's about taxing our buildings and, you know, to and offices. Off yeah, in terms of offices. their water consumption. Yeah, yeah. Yes, I, I think, you know, we are paying already a lot of taxes. I, I think, you know, this is, uh, would be quite aggressive to people to tax them even more. Just for, yeah, but maybe it would be an incentive for them that, to do something, right? I think what we can do is also sensitize people about not wasting. That is very important. And we need to also have the type of buildings we need to revise. And there is in Flanders a lot of progress on that. Our um, Minister of Justice and, and, and Environment as well, the is really investing in that. So she, she's, she, she's working a lot on that, that people can innovate uh, their, their houses or their offices. And it's quite supported publicly so that you can make it more environmental friendly. And you will need even less energy, less water, and less of all, all, all issues. I think it's, it's, it's important to, to look at that. I am a more someone who would approach things more positively. I prefer to, to persuade the citizen to do things better instead of aggressing them. Mikel um, in Poland has been watching us this afternoon. Thanks for joining us. He's got a question. What can Poland do and its citizens to retain and save more water? Obviously, he's asking about Poland, but maybe there's a question here more generally in Europe. What can citizens do to retain and save more water? Um, Justin, um, what would you say to that? Well, I think there's some things we can do personally, of course, use less water uh, in our daily lives. But I think there's a, there's a lot of opportunity for the, the water suppliers themselves to actually be more efficient. Um, we, we see in some, some major cities around the world where the, uh, the leakages actually account for, you know, say, 20 percent of the total water supply. And if that can be fixed, then that actually provides a bit of a buffer against the potential impacts of climate change as well. Um, so it's kind of like a no brainer almost, but it does require good technology and innovations there to actually, you know, detect those leaks and figure out where the pressures are not right to actually become more efficient. So I think it's a bit of it's a bit of top down um, from the companies themselves pushed by government to become more efficient. But also, obviously, we can do a lot as ourselves in, in terms of our water usage. SR Dane has asked a question. How can the filtration and cleaning systems such as those used in the UK aid the issues regarding the availability of clean water. So Sol, you're a bit of an expert in this in terms of filtration and cleaning systems. How important are they in terms of their use in terms of providing water generally? I, I think it's important to, to have, to invest in filtration systems to tackle issues of water uh, pollution, of contamination. Uh, there's a lot of this that we do, for example, in Bangladesh. Uh, to tackle issues of salinization of, of, of the water resources. So clearly a really important part of the solution. I would know less on the UK specific side. Okay. Um, Asita, another one for you. I'm sorry to keep coming back to you. Um, can the EU, do you think, pool funding to help those areas where availability of water is an issue? For example, providing infrastructure and facilitating recycling plants, etc. So should the EU be looking to do more together to share resources to deal with this? Look, I'm going to maybe uh, sound surprising here, but I think, first of all, uh, it's 
quite it's too ambitious to imagine that eu is going to be able to solve all the issues in the world because eu is just a tiny part of the globe i think that um political leaders of every country are responsible in providing for their people and some political leaders are not really doing it i'm looking at some african countries where they're really just busy about themselves and i i saw it while growing up and i think they need to take responsibility on that at a level of development cooperation there are already a lot of funds bilaterally poured into all kinds of, of, of issues, but we see that on the ground there is not really always a progress. So I am advocating to not give money anymore to public uh, um, bodies, but only to NGOs and to organizations that are really active on the ground and that can be held accountable. Next to that, I am a strong believer of the contribution of the private sector. When you look at the sustainable development goals, there are specific uh, SDGs that are linked to gender, that are linked to uh, access to water, that are linked to climate change and to living in dignity. And I think these, we need to focus on those as well. Thanks for watching the highlights of our latest Year in News virtual debate. Why not join the conversation? Add your comments. Bye for now.